Welcome to Have Your Say, I'm Mike Wooldridge. Today our subject is religion and the existence of God. Did God create man or did man create God? Is religion a source of good in the world or of evil? Without religion, how could we define these terms? Our guest is Professor Richard Dawkins, who's an atheist and the author of the book, of the, book the God Delusion. Call or email him your questions. What do you believe? Here's how to get in touch. You can phone Have Your Say on 4420-8749-5353 or email us. The address is haveyoursay at bbc.co.uk. You can also send an SMS text message to 4477-361100. All of those details and information on other ways to get in touch are on our website, bbcnews.com slash haveyoursay. Professor Dawkins is the holder of the Charles Simone Chair of Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University. He's written many books, including The God Delusion, in which he makes the case that a belief in God is not just irrational, but potentially deadly. Uh, welcome to the program, but before we come to you, here's a sample of some of the comments on our website. Felix Alvarez from Gibraltar says, isn't the atheist mantra, science doesn't have all the answers yet, the same as the religious mantra, God exists. Neither has or can prove their positions and continue to rely on faith. Penny in the United States says, God's work feeds the poor, helps those in need after disaster, builds schools, opens hospitals. Doing God's work in his way means leave your own stuff behind. It's not necessary. Please look at the whole package. Richard Dawkins, uh, first you, you were born in Kenya, uh, and then you went to uh, live for a few years anyway in what was Nyasaland, now, now Malawi. Uh, loosely, at least, you had an Anglican upbringing. How did you get from there to where you stand on religion today? At the age of about nine, I realized that there was more than one religion and that people all over the world think different things. And it was an accident that I happened to be being brought up Anglican. I realized that if I'd been brought up in a Muslim country, I'd be Muslim. If I'd been brought up in a Hindu country, I'd be Hindu. And so it seemed to be a pure accident that I was Christian, as I thought. But it's a long way from that to becoming an atheist. Well, it's at least, uh, it, it sowed the seeds of doubt. And then uh, I then went back to being a Christian. I was confirmed at the age of about 13. And continued to be a Christian until I was about 15. The main argument being the argument from design. The world's such a beautiful, elegant place, it looks designed. So it was then that I, I finally discovered Darwinism that finally made me an atheist. Uh, let's be clear about your position on the existence or otherwise of God. You say in, in The God Delusion that God, though not technically disprovable, is very, very improbable indeed. Um, can you explain uh, in a couple of sentences, how you have reached that conclusion then, and what exactly it means. There's an awful lot of things you can't disprove. You can't disprove fairies, you can't disprove flying teapots and unicorns. Uh, I believe in God to exactly the same extent as I believe in fairies and unicorns. I can't disprove any of them, but there's no reason positively to believe in any of them. And the book, The God Delusion, how many copies is that uh, now sold? It's always called a runaway bestseller. Uh, J just over a million and a half copies in English alone. And in how many languages has it been uh, published? 31 languages. And what do you read into those, uh, th that level of sales? I think that uh, the time has come for the world to have a bit of a rethink, because mine's not the only book on the same theme that's selling very well. Right, well, let's go to our first uh, caller then, uh, Professor Dick Joyce from Switzerland. Uh, you have a question that you want to put to Professor Richard Dawkins? Yes. Um, the, the first question I was going to ask was why he calls himself uh, an atheist when it's clear from his own work that he's actually an agnostic. But I think it's merely a question of semantics, and I don't want to pursue that. What, what I would like to say is that I agree entirely with the uh, position that he's taken in regard to this subject. But what disappoints me about his book uh, and his views is how unscientifically they're presented. Uh, I, I have the, the old-fashioned view that P probability estimate never equals zero or one, and therefore the right way to tackle this question is to do a proper scientific inquiry, the methodology for which exists or, or can be developed, to see whether in fact belief in some uh, 
other entity, let's call it God or what you will, actually does more harm than it does good. I think all that Professor Dawkins managed to say is that it does do more harm, and I'm not convinced that he's proved it, although I believe he's right. Right, let's just get uh, Professor Dawkins' response to that, that you, in, in well, essence you're not being scientific. There's a confusion there between probability of the existence of God and probability that, God, that, 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 that religion does harm. Uh, I fully accept that the probability is not either zero or one, but some, somewhere in between, and I think the probability of God's existence is, as, I, as you've quoted me as saying, very, very low. So 1% or something, or, le or less than 1%. And, and I discuss let me just, that... Let me just interrupt. Doesn't that make you an agnostic? Yes, it does. Then, rather than an atheist? It, of, of course it does. But we are all agnostic about fairies. That was the point I was wanting to, to make before. We are technically agnostic about fairies because you cannot say the probability of fairies is zero. You can say that it's very low, and that's what I feel about the, about the existence of God. But Professor Joyce suddenly switched at the end of his question from probability of the existence of God to probability that religion does harm. And that's an entirely different question. And it's not one that I would like to put a probability figure on. It's, it's a question that... that is, it's a question that interests me less than the question of the, the purely scientific question of the existence of God. Uh, Professor Joyce? Well, um, there I do very markedly disagree with Professor Dawkins. I think this is the practical question, and that's the question that we really need to answer, and I believe it can be answered, or an approach to its answering can be made. Well, uh, I'm interested to hear that, and uh, I would like to hear how Professor Joyce would put a number on the probability that religion does is, has a net evil effect? Is that, is that what you're saying, sir? Yes, I'm saying that I think the, the methodology does exist or can be developed from existing methodologies to give a useful, practical, usable answer to this question, which to my mind is the important one to try and answer. Well, right. th I mean, that's extremely interesting, but it, it is a different question, yeah, and I, it's I perfectly that. possible that the existence of God has a probability near, near zero, and the probability that, that religion does good could be quite high, but it still doesn't mean that God let, exists. Let me, just, no, no, no. Uh, Bray, let me just interrupt you both there, if I may, uh, to uh, read this email we've had from Jenny in the United Kingdom. Uh, you wouldn't say the Ferrari F1 car evolved from an explosion in a junkyard, so isn't it ludicrous to say that the human eye or the reproductive system just evolved by random chance and mutation? It is certainly ludicrous to say that the eye evolved by random chance and mutation, and that's precisely what Darwinians do not say. Uh, we say that it evolved by natural selection, which is not random, and it is not ludicrous. It is a highly uh, elegant theory which works and which is the only theory that has ever been proposed, the only workable theory that's ever been proposed to account for the, the existence of complex things like eyes. Ferrari cars we account for by design because there are humans to design them and that pushes back the question where did the humans come from mm. and the answer to that is evolution by natural selection. Uh, Professor Joyce, just a, a brief last word from you. Uh, well, uh, let me just emphasize again that for me, perhaps not for Professor Dawkins, the important question is the one that I, I voiced. I, I couldn't care less about agnosticism versus atheism as a, as a question to be the one that I, I voiced. I, I couldn't care less about agnosticism versus atheism as a, as a question to be answered. I couldn't care less about uh, whether religion is believed to be uh, bad or good, what I would like is a factual answer, and I believe we can get it. Right. Well, thank, thank you, you for that. Yeah. And let me bring in our second caller, Alan uh, Aramid from Warsaw in Poland. You have a question that you want to put to Professor Richard Dawkins? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Dawkins. Hello. Hello. Uh, my question to you is, um, if one day you you die, or after death, you suddenly find out that uh, there is a God out there, will you, what would your reaction be? Will you be surprised? Will you, be, uh, you, will you say you are wrong? Or will you just say, please forgive me, God? Well, the first thing I might say is, which God are you? Are you Zeus, or Thor, or Apollo, or Baal? Uh, and then the next question I would ask would be, why did you conceal yourself so adequately? 
Did you deliberately go out of your way to make it look as though you don't exist? And the third question I would ask would be a whole lot of questions about science, because if there is a God, then he would have, or she would have, or it would have, a whole lot of fascinating answers to fascinating questions. And assuming that he had the time, which I rather doubt, to answer my questions, I would love to ask all sorts of questions about science. Alan Aramid, is that the answer you were expecting? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not so satisfied, uh, but let it be. I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, and um, I think uh, I read a lot of thing, uh, things about you on the internet, and uh, I haven't uh, come across your, uh, your books. I think I'll read them. But uh, what I think is, um, you know, it's just impossible for, uh, to, for, for the uh, Earth to exist without um, anything being behind it. I mean, in my own case, God. So that's, that's it. So in, in your own case, can you just, uh, just explain what you mean by that? Yeah, that in my own case, yeah. God is behind yes. the creation, you know, God is the creator. Uh, that uh, the heart cannot exist without, just couldn't exist without uh, anybody or anything being uh, behind it. Well, what is behind God then? Oh, well, when we die, we will know. That when is, you I die, think, what, if it, what if you get to heaven and it turns out to be Baal? Wait, Professor Douglas, uh, sorry to cut you. I think, you know... I've, I also, I was also, uh, um, um, I was, al I was also um, a non-believer. I was an uh, atheist, and uh, suddenly something will come in your life that uh, you will find out that it cannot happen just like that. That it must be, uh, you know. In my own case, it was God, but you know, many people. Live and okay. uh, they just, something just happens to them that change, uh, changes their life, and they start to believe. So I can understand you because you are at age, you are at age, and uh, you haven't experienced what other uh, believer, or believers or Muslims or Christians have uh, experienced. Right. But, I, uh, I think uh, you also need to understand them. Uh, maybe okay. you are still living, and I wish you to live uh, <laughs> longer. But um, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if one day you just experience something that will convince you um, that a good uh, right. exists. Alan Aramid, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Lida. I'm afraid we'll have to uh, uh, end it there. Thank you very much for your call. Uh, and only because we turn now to, uh, to Istanbul in Turkey, where we can speak to uh, uh, Aslihan Eker. Uh, now, of course, in the case of Turkey, The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins' book, has been uh, published there, but both the publisher and the translator, I gather, are being investigated to see whether charges should be brought against them. Do you believe that the book should have been published uh, in Turkey, given the stand that uh, Richard Dawkins takes on religion? Um, I think yes. Uh, I think freedom of expression should be protected by law um, in any cases. But I think there should be borders. Uh, I mean, people should not offend other people um, in, I mean, in terms of their religion, their race, or other things. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't read the book. Uh, but the reader uh, who complained about his book, Mr. Dawkins' book, um, said that it was a, it was an offensive book uh, somehow. Um, but, but your, your uh, point is one of I principle, mean, that whatever is in it, you believe that it, it should be published. People should have the freedom to, to read it. Definitely, yeah, definitely. I think, I mean, uh, there is no comp compulsory in religion. Uh, it's what we believe in Islam. So uh, people should be able to uh, uh, express their views you, if they don't believe God. And I, uh, I mean, I'm sure there will be other people who will confront them uh, if they want, I mean, if they don't believe what they say. So it should be, I mean, the, this discussion, the debate should be in terms of uh, like intellectual um, uh, area, not like, you know, kind of in the courts. Uh, Asahan, you wear the headscarf yourself. Uh, tell us a little mm -hmm. about your own belief and, and in particular how you define God, how you define Allah in your own understanding of faith. Right. Um, I mean, what we believe is there is one God, God um, and n not other, and God is, I mean, um, 
it's just a unique God. Uh, Allah is a unique, and uh, we cannot describe um, Him, and we don't know where He is, and like there is no description. So um, I mean, <laughs> so what? That's it. So from that standpoint, then, uh, what question would you want to put to uh, Professor Dawkins in that he does not believe in the existence of God? Um, right. Um, I mean, in, in this case, um, I would ask him, I mean, not uh, in his uh, belief or uh, not this belief in, in God, but uh, in this case, I, I would ask him uh, whether he, um, he thinks that he's offending the uh, people, believers, uh, I mean, in any religion, in Christianity or Islam, whether he, he's believing that, you know, he um, kind of humiliates people who believe uh, in God. So, I mean, okay. it's, it's my question. I think uh, he has a right to say what he believes uh, okay. in a scientific way. Okay. Uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, would you accept well, that you could be offending? I'm delighted, a large of all, I'm delighted, first of all, to hear that the lady thinks that my book shouldn't be censored. Uh, I'm sorry to hear she hasn't read it. I hope she will read it. And when she does read it, I think she will conclude that it is not offensive. Um, obviously, you can't accuse a book of being offensive unless you've, unless you've read it. Um, I believe strongly that you would not find it offensive. But it is very likely that there are many people who would... Really if you are offended by reading views that disagree with yours, then yes, you will be offended. However, it's not gratuitously offensive. It simply puts an argument and if your views are strong enough, as I believe they are, you will be able to defend your views. You will not say, oh, it's offensive, it's offensive. You will say, no, you're wrong here, and you're wrong here, and you're wrong here. And that's what you should do. And so, I think uh, that is what okay. you would do, and I hope you will do it when you've read the book. Uh, Aslan, what would your response be to that? Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think um, he, he's right. I think I should yeah, I read the book uh, to be able to, I mean, say, uh, to be able to answer what, what he's saying right now. And um, yes, uh, I mean, if, he, if it's not offensive, I think he has every right to, uh, to, to express himself. Um, and he's a scientist, uh, obviously, and I mean, he has a right to, um, I think, every right to uh, say what he believes in. And I'm sure, I mean, there will be other people, theolo theologists or scientists, who will to, uh, say what he believes in. And I'm sure, I mean, there will be other people, theolo theologists or scientists, who will um, confront him in the right way. Asahan there in uh, Istanbul. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's go now to our next uh, caller, Dominic uh, uh, Rentienz, uh, sorry, Rentienz from uh, Australia. Uh, your question, please, to uh, Professor Dawkins. Um, yeah, uh, my question to Professor Dawkins is where, where does he sit with quantum mechanics? Because I see in his book, just for example, that he declares miracles um, have no scientific merit at all, but as soon as you come into the area of this new physics, of quantum physics, um, you do have a situation where thought uh, is believed to can influence uh, physical events. You have particles that are uh, possible to be in two places at once. Um, and uh, so Mr. Emoto has done some um, experiments with the effects of thought upon water, the molecular structure. Um, I just wonder where he sits with this kind of new and rapidly developing science. I mean, okay. new in the let's, scientific world. Right, let's see. Uh, Richard Dawkins, we're moving on here then from Darwinism, from natural selection, to an area of silence, science that you indeed acknowledge in the book is, is in your terms, less precise. Uh, we can be I'm not sure about less precise, but uh, certainly deeply mysterious. Mm -hmm. And uh, quantum physics has two extraordinary properties. One, it is very, very mysterious to the human mind. Things like the two-slit experiment, which the caller referred to. And also, the predictions that you can deduce from quantum theory are astonishingly accurate. They are just astoundingly accurate. Richard Feynman uh, said it's equivalent to predicting the width of North America to the accuracy of the width of one human hair. But Richard Feynman also so, said... So how would you relate that to arguments over the existence or otherwise right. of God? Richard Feynman also said, if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. Now what the caller has done is to confound two kinds of mysteriousness. 
he has said quantum theory is mysterious and it, it gives the appearance, at least some interpretations of it, give the appearance that thought can influence things. Miracles are deeply mysterious. That doesn't mean in the slightest degree that the miracles, things like the raising of Lazarus, the, the virgin birth, uh, the turning water into wine and things like that, have any connection whatsoever with modern physics. It's a typical piece of obscurantism to take something that is very deeply difficult to understand in modern physics and to tie it up with some ancient legend which has no connection with it whatsoever. And I recommend the caller to read the works of the physicist Victor Stenger, who goes into these matters very well. Okay, right. Uh, we'll leave that there and uh, turn to uh, our next email from Jay O'Brien uh, in London. <coughs> Atheism works. Uh, Jay O'Brien writes, if you are a fat and happy, educated Westerner with plenty of time on your hands and a bank balance that allows you to spend time pondering your own navel and the universes. No God equals no hope. Quick response to that. <laughs> if that were true, then it would not bear in the slightest degree on the truth of atheism. If it were true that only fat and wealthy and happy people are capable of being atheists, which it is not true, but if it were true, then it wouldn't in any way make atheism false. Uh, if God does give you hope, maybe God di gives you hope, but that doesn't make God true. You cannot say that just because you hope something is true, that therefore it will be true. Okay, well, just a reminder, this is Have Your Say, live around the globe on World Television, World Service Radio, and on our website, bbcnews.com slash haveyoursay. We're talking about the existence of God with the author of The God Delusion, Professor Richard Dawkins. What do you believe? Please get in touch. You can phone Have Your Say on 4420-8749-5353 or email us. The address is haveyoursay at bbc.co.uk. You can also send an SMS text message to 4477-361100. All of those details and information on other ways to get in touch are on our website, bbcnews.com slash haveyoursay. Now, by the internet from Rome, is the Professor of Ethics and Media at the European University of Rome, Father Jonathan Morris. Uh, also the author of the soon-to-be-released book, The Promise, God's Purpose and Plan for When Life Hurts. Um, Father Morris, uh, recently the Pope published an encyclical, encyclical about hope, but in which he attacked atheism. Just tell us a little bit more about that first and, and how sure. that relates both to the subject of atheism and to these arguments over the existence of God. Well, let me just say, as I was walking over here to the studio and passing by the window of the Pope, I thought to myself, this is the perfect or nearly perfect thinking man's Pope. And it's great that Richard Dawkins, and it's a pleasure to be talking to you, sir, is living during the same time. Now, I also thought of another thing when I read the encyclical, and that is this. When John Paul II, in March of 2000, came into St. Peter's Basilica, and he made an unbelievable statement, he said, I want to ask forgiveness for the actions of those Christians who have committed evil in the name of religion. Amazing! And then, I would say, the deputy of doctrine, at the time Cardinal Ratzinger becomes Pope, and he writes this encyclical, and he says, you know what? Christians or religion, true religion, does not have a monopoly, does not have a monopoly on fanaticism. And he takes us back to the horrendous, horrendous activities of the, of the, last, of the last century, of the 20th century. And he said, in the name of atheism, in the name of atheism, Hitler, Stalin, Mao committed what uh, unbelievable atrocities, we could say 100 million at least, arbitrary killings of the innocent human beings. We compare that to, for example, the Spanish Inquisition, for which, at least in part, the Pope was asking forgiveness. We could say maybe 5,000 and 10,000 hor horrific acts as well, no doubt, of forcing religion. But the Pope is saying, if religion does not in any way have a monopoly on fanaticism, you and I, Mr. Dawkins, need to stand together. And we need to say terrible things have been done as well in the name of atheism. I think that's the point of bringing in, I would say, of Pope Benedict, 
the likes of Mr. Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and he does it really reaching out to a hand, not to condemn, but to invite okay. for real dialogue. All right, let's get Richard Dawkins' response to that. Terrible things were done by the Spanish Inquisition in the name of religion. Terrible things were done by Hitler, not in the name of atheism. Terrible things were done by Stalin, not in the name of atheism. Stalin happened to be an atheist. Hitler happened to be a Roman Catholic. Neither of them did their terrible deeds, their te terrible deeds in the name of either atheism or religion. They did their terrible deeds in the name of other doctrines. The Spanish Inquisition did its terrible deeds in the name of religion. So, uh, sure, let me respond to that. If that's okay, Mike. Let me just say, um, I don't think the people who are watching uh, Professor Dawkins um, really believe you. At least those who are historians. Now, I know you're not a historian. You're a scientist, but you're stepping out of your venue, I would say. Are, are you we telling know that. Me? Let me say, let me say this, Mr. Dawkins. Let me just finish real quickly. Um, that Hitler and Stalin, what they did, they were trying to create religion-free utopia. And they had a very much a vested interest in not just creating a utopia of secular humanism, but a humanism that is completely void of those who would, who would claim the existence of God. If you'd like to get into that as well, which I know is philosophy and theology, which is not your venue either, I'd be happy to do so of those who would, who would claim the existence of God. If you'd like to get into that as well, which I know is philosophy and theology, which is not your venue either, I'd be happy to do so. It is very different to happen to be an atheist and to do things in the name of atheism. I don't believe that anybody has done terrible disease deeds in the name of atheism. Why would they? What would be the point? Stalin did terrible deeds in the name of a communist utopia. Hitler did terrible deeds in the name of a racist utopia. Dystopia, one should say. Neither of them were representing atheism. Atheism is not responsible for anything that they do. Religion was responsible for what the Spanish Inquisition did, not modern religious people, but religious people at the time. Right. Uh, Father okay, Martin, you, in Rome, yes. stay, stay with us just for a moment. I want to bring in uh, Trish Devine calling from uh, France. Uh, what would you like to say on, on this particular issue, on, on the encyclical issue by the Pope to do with atheism and, and how it plays into this debate? Well, I do think he's speaking of the nonsense. I absolutely agree with Professor Dawkins. Uh, it's not as if atheism itself is actually a movement. You know, atheists don't believe in God the way they don't believe in many other things, like the Loch Ness Monster. But we don't have a name for people who don't believe in the Loch Ness Monster. Um, Stalin indeed was an atheist, but Hitler was a Catholic. And most of the Nazis who carried out those terrible deeds under the National Socialist Program were themselves practicing Christians. I also believe that because Hitler was brought up in a Christian background, this is one of the reasons that he hated Jews so much because this was always part of the church's teaching. So what would, what would you say then, Trish Devine, about, if you like, religion's influence in the world? I think religion can uh, be, be influential for good, but they can also be very influential for bad. And only today, in today's Observer, we have a story about evangelical Christianity causing uh, people in Nigeria to attack their children as witches. Uh, let's go back to you then, Father Morris in Rome. Uh, sure, Richard Dawkins, sure. uh, not alone in his argument. <laughs> right, not alone, exactly. You know what's, what's great about uh, Catholic doctrine and Christian doctrine as well, I would say in general, is we can go back and find out what did the founder of Christianity say? And what do the leaders right now of Christianity say about violence in the name of religion? In true religion, and here I don't stand up for all religions, there's plenty of religions I wouldn't want my little sister being, to be involved in, but in true religion, we can go back and say, what does Jesus Christ say about violence in his name? He was the Prince of Peace. What does the Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, what's in Martin Luther King? And then let me just say, to call Hitler, to call Stalin, practicing Christians, is absolutely ridiculous. You don't wipe out something that you adhere to. It's just not intellectually honest. So, uh, Trish Devine then and, and Richard Dawkins, to build on that point perhaps, uh, are you both in fact uh, tarring all religion, if you like, with the brush of bad religion? I am not. Sorry. Uh, Trish Devine? Oh, well, um, I, I don't go quite as far as Professor Dawkins. I have read his work. Um, I don't tend to think that uh, moderate Christians have been under the wedge. But I do think that there is a polarization in world religion at the moment, which is extremely dangerous. It's dangerous both on the Islamic side and dangerous on the evangelical Christian side. 
because anybody who takes a literal reading of the, book, the Bible, excuse me, to be accurate, um, I think is probably quite dangerous. The, the Bible, for instance, does say, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And this is one of the things that is currently being quoted at Nigerian mothers. Uh, for instance, if a little boy dies in a family, a little girl can be accused of being a witch. Okay, let's just get, get Richard Dawkins. I have, no, well. I have no desire to tar uh, religious people with the evils that have been done in the name of religion. It was the father who brought that up. It was the Pope who said that Stalin and Hitler did terrible deeds in the name of, of atheism. I am perfectly happy to say there are very many good Christians, good, good Muslims. I do not wish to tar anybody with the brush of anything. It was the Pope who chose to call Hitler and Stalin, atheists, atheists, and to say that they did things in the name of atheism. That, is, that was the towering that was done. I was simply responding to that. Okay. Uh, Father Morris, thanks very much indeed, and uh, Trish Devine as well. Uh, let me just read to you uh, an email that's come in while we've been on air from uh, Richard Harris in, in London. As science and reason continue to peel back layers of truth and religion as an answer becomes more obviously wrong, can you envisage a future world in which we wonder why any of us ever believed in God. Richard Dawkins? Obviously, I hope to look forward to such a world. Uh, and uh, my only disappointment is that we haven't apparently reached that stage yet, because it seems to me we ought to have done. Um, but yes, of course, I do hope for that. And uh, another email, uh, this one from David Thomas in Wales. Professor Dawkins, I teach my children about Jesus Christ. I teach them he is the Son of God, and they believe in him, and, do, and if they believe in him and do his teachings, they will go to heaven. Am I, David Thomas asks, a child abuser? Because you have said that you're worried well, about what you, you see as indoctrination of children in, in uh, religious families. The, the, the first thing I'd say is, why do you teach your children about Jesus being the Son of God? Why don't you teach your children about Mohammed and his winged horse? The answer is that you were brought up uh, as Christian and not Muslim. Why don't you teach your children about Lord Shiva? Uh, the answer is you were not brought up Hindu. So it is arbitrary which religion you were brought up in. Now, there's a myth going about that I have said that all religious teaching is child abuse, and I have not said that. What I have said is that labelling children with the religion of their parents, saying to a child, you are a Christian child, is a form of child abuse. What I would prefer you to say is, there are lots of religions in the world, the Christians believe this, the Muslims believe that, the Hindus believe the other, uh, and when you're old enough, you can take your pick as to which, if any, religion you want to follow. There is one other thing that I think is child abuse, and that is frightening children, to, uh, frightening children out of their wits by teaching them about hellfire. And I trust and believe that you don't do that. Well, on this same issue, let's bring in our next caller, Louisa, in Cambridge. Your, your question to uh, Professor Dawkins. Good afternoon, Professor Dawkins. Um, as an RE teacher at secondary school in Cambridgeshire, I believe it is very important that people are able to make up their own minds about their faith and beliefs. Um, I was just wondering if you agree with this, and why you do or why not? I strongly agree that people should make up their own minds. In particular, as I said in answer to the last question, children should not be told what religion they belong to. By all means, let's teach children about all uh, available religions in a comparative way. And the history of religion, you can't obviously understand history at all unless you go into religion. You can't take your illusions in English literature unless you know about at least the Christian religion, and also, by the way, the ancient Greek and Roman religions. But the children should be free to make up their own minds, and so should we all. And my book is an endeavor to help people to make up their own minds. I hope they'll read my book, along with Christian books, Muslim books, Jewish books, etc. Louisa, if I can ask you, what do you teach about atheism? Um, well, we try to cover a range of different things. Um, I use Professor Dawkins' program, The Root of All Evil, as a very interesting um, source. And we obviously try to give a very um, non-biased kind of um, approach to the issue of, of atheism so that people are able to make their own minds up. What concerns me is I wonder whether Professor Dawkins believes that um, there is any future for our e-teachers um, if we are indeed teaching perhaps delusional material. Oh, no, I, I think there is a future because you are teaching something that's Im immensely important for the understanding of history and literature. And also I think that modern RE teaching doesn't just teach religion but teaches ethics and philosophy and sort of civics generally. So I'm sure there is a future for RE teachers, yes. 
So, Professor okay. Dawkins, would you prefer it um, that the society, as you mentioned earlier, was um, more religion-free, and therefore perhaps there is no longer a place for religion to be taught? Well, no, I, as I said, I do think it's important to, to teach comparative religion, which I think you probably do, yeah. uh, because you can't... Uh, it's, it's a part of history. If you look back at history, so many of the wars of European history, for example, almost all of them, actually, uh, in, until the 20th century, have been about, about religion. So you couldn't begin to understand European history, for example, almost all of them, actually, uh, in, until the 20th century, have been about, about religion. So you couldn't begin to understand the Middle Ages without religion. You can't understand Shakespeare without religion. There are all sorts of parts of our education which would be meaningless unless you teach about religion. Louisa, just briefly, can I ask you what reaction you get from parents who are believers uh, when you teach their children what you were just explaining about atheism and, and when you uh, indeed cite the books that you, you were talking about? Yes, of course. I mean, as I say, I, I give a very um, wide and unbiased um, approach to the, to the issue, but I think parents are, are delighted that their pupils are able to and their students are able to um, engage in different varieties of material. The, the issue of, of atheism obviously is, is something very important, but I, I hope that Professor Dawkins acknowledges that there is, there is room for all religions and um, the discussion of such God um, in the curriculum, so that's the most important thing for my pupils to learn about. Okay, Louisa, thank you very much indeed uh, thank, for your comments and questions. Thank you very much indeed. I very much appreciate your answer. Okay. Uh, let's go to our next caller on the line from Hong Kong, David Whitten. Your question uh, to Professor Richard Dawkins, please. Hi there, good evening. Good evening. Hi there. Um, my question to you is this. Um, as a scientist, Professor Dawkins, uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, well, basically I agree with you, science does explain the world better than religion for sure. Um, but what science and religion, and I think particularly monotheism in that department especially, have in common, is they're both based on and use the process of thought and conceptuality. And my question is, what is the understanding, for want of a better word, that we used to seek through religion, and many now do so through science, is actually an experience and not an idea or a concept? I don't know what that means. Um, an experience and not an idea or a concept. Can you just e explain a little more briefly, David Whitten? Sorry? Can you just explain that a little bit more, expand on that a little bit more? Um, well, uh, Professor, I assume you'd agree that um, religion and uh, science, well, science is looking for some kind of understanding or explanation of the world. But maybe the understanding or reason or sense or something that we're looking for is not an idea or a thought, it's actually an experience. Well, I, I have to say again, I, I'm not sure what that would look like. I, I seek to understand. I seek to, to, to get a picture for why we're here, what life is about, where the universe came from, where the world came from, uh, where life is going, all those sorts of questions. And experience, well, of course, I have, a, I have experience of life, but I don't know what it would mean to say that, uh, that, that experience is what religion gives you. Um, well, I don't mean religion per se, I mean just like as an individual, we, of course we all experience life all the time. We have different thoughts and ideas, and when we look inside ourselves, we can see how the thought process and the process of ideas and conceptuality actually work. But maybe those things internally aren't good enough for like grasping what maybe life is, and like I say again, for actually experiencing maybe accurately what it is. I, I have nothing to say. But it is, uh, well, it is the case, isn't it, Richard Dawkins, that um, uh, in a way, God and science, religion and science have become uh, more, have become seen as more compatible by many scientists. They've become more open, if you like, to randomness, even to improbability, not claiming to have answers for so many things. There's been a shift, has there not? There's a tremendous difference between saying that uh, we don't have all, all the answers and, and saying that therefore religion does. Um, of course science doesn't have all the answers, science is working on it, uh, but uh, to the extent that science doesn't have all the answers, and of course it doesn't, what on earth makes anyone think that religion does? Okay, uh, David Whitten, thank you very much indeed for your call. Let's go to uh, uh, an email that's come in while we've been on the air from Singapore, um, from Carl Brunais, who says this, can't we assume that we won't find the answer to the question of whether God exists, at least as mortals on this planet? 
Yes, I think we can assume that we won't find the answer to the question whether Baal or Zeus or Jupiter or Thor or Mithras and, exists. Right, he goes on okay. to ask, uh, is there really any point in discussing the issue besides that of entertainment value? I think there's a very good p point in discussing whether there is some kind of supernatural creator in the universe. I think it is a very big question. I think it's a supremely big question, uh, and a very interesting question, and I think that all the evidence points to the answer, no. I don't think it's a futile question, just because you can't give an absolutely definite answer. I believe you can probably give a probability answer, and that the probability will turn out to be very low. Okay, let's bring in our next uh, caller, who uh, is a Conservative MP here in Britain, Mark Pritchard. Um, your view of uh, Christianity, really, and uh, its, its place in the world, the strength of its beliefs, in the light of what uh, Richard Dawkins has been saying today? Well, I'm glad uh, Professor Dawkins used the word probability there. Um, reading his book, God Delusion, you would perhaps think that, um, you know, one of the great questions of the universe uh, ha had been answered, one of the ultimate uh, questions, and, and of course we know that it hasn't, and Professor Dawkins I think would be the first person to admit that uh, we're weighing evidence in science, and he's one of the preeminent natural scientists of the world, that one judges prob uh, probabilities, not proof, So there is no proof that God does not exist. I fully accept that there's no proof that God does not exist. You presumably accept there's no proof that fairies do not exist. It doesn't mean that you think it's the slightest bit likely that they do. Well, I think, um, and you're referring to your uh, own, uh, what you call, I think, the in infantile theory that when we're um, all young, we put our sort of, uh, teeth under the pillow and perhaps get 50 pence in return. And yes, as children, one, you know, we do believe in all sorts of fantasies and fairy tales, such as Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. But um, uh, there is a problem with that particular uh, proposition, and that is, of course, there are many people... Uh, that grow up and they then discard uh, their uh, views on Santa Claus and uh, the Tooth Fairy. Um, but there are many people that grow up into adult, adulthood, having been atheists in their teenage years, who then find faith in God. So I'm afraid that theory isn't consistent. Well, well Richard, uh, just to come in, Richard Dawkins, you, I gather, believe, uh, are concerned about something you call Christian phobia. You believe that religion in this country is under threat, is that right? Yeah, the debate uh, I, I tabled in the House of Commons this week, Christianophobia, was not uh, a debate on religion per se, but it was really saying that there is increasing feeling amongst people from the Christian tradition that many of the main uh, Christian festivals and traditions such as Christmas and Easter are being often sidelined and marginalized, sometimes by stealth, sometimes openly. And I think this is a mixture, a, a combination of the sort of politically correct brigade along with fundamentalist, atheist, and militant secularists. And um, I just think that unless mainstream political parties stand up for the Christian traditions of this nation going back to the first century, then unfortunately those traditions will be hijacked by people in extremist parties such as the uh, BNP. And also I think it's wrong that um, fundamentalist secularists should suggest that other, or even politically correct people, suggest that other faiths are offended by Christian traditions. That is not true. I've never met a single Muslim, Sikh, Buddhist, or person okay. of any other faith that is objected to the Christian traditions of this nation. Mark Richard, thank you very much. Uh, Richard Dawkins, briefly, th I mean, there is a problem there, is there? If, I mean, you might not believe in the traditions we're talking about here, but if they are uh, done away with, if they are very severely challenged, they, it, it can be destabilizing yes. for a society. I, I agree. I mean, I, I'm not one of those who wants to, wants to stop Christian traditions. This, this is historically a Christian country. Um, I'm a cultural Christian, the same way as many of my friends call themselves cultural Jews or cu cultural Muslims. Um, so, yes, I love singing carols along with everybody else. I'm not one of those who wants to purge our society of our Christian history. If there is any threat to those sorts of things, I, I think you'll find it comes from rival religions and not from atheists. Okay, let's go to our next caller, Alan uh, Riepsamer in The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, your point, please. Hi, Mr. Dawkins. Uh, the thing okay, let's go to our next caller, Alan uh, Riepsamer in The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, your point, please. Hi, Mr. Dawkins. Uh, the thing is, I don't really care what people believe in as long as they keep it to themselves or not bother other people with it, or worse, force their particular rules upon others. Isn't it your view as well that religion needs to retreat into the personal space rather than being in the public space? Yes, I think that uh, if everybody took the view that you do, the world would be a much better place if people kept their religion to themselves. Unfortunately, they don't, 
uh, an awful lot of people feel the urge to impose their religion on other people and that's really one of the things that has got some of us rather riled up. Uh, in case anybody thinks that I'm trying to impose my lack of religion on any, anybody, I'm really not. You, you can read my book if you want. You don't have to if you don't want to. I'm not I, doing any imposing. Adam, when you talk about taking religion into more into personal space, are you thinking there of what people call nowadays uh, very often uh, spirituality, mysticism goes by various terms. I feel like a very much a sort of new and growing phenomenon of, of religion in the East and, and in the West as um, well. Uh, and if you are, uh, Richard Dawkins, um, do you accept that this is uh, something that can be entirely different? This deals with a, um, a, a form of human understanding, or something, if you like, that is mysticism of that kind, can be beyond human understanding, the explanations of science altogether? Yes, uh, I, I have no problem with that, and it's what I call Einsteinian religion. Um, Einstein's religion, he used the word religion, and he even used the word God, was all about the deep mysteries in the, in the universe. So Einstein used the word God as a symbol for that which we don't understand. And it's perfectly okay, I think, to be mystical about that. But I thought that what the caller was talking about was people keeping religion to themselves rather than imposing it on other people, as in interfering with stem cell research, uh, interfering with... Um, the, the rights of gay people and things like that, which they do, because religious people very often love to talk about sin, which means, pr which means things that the rest of us would regard as private. Right, we'll, we'll need to move on, I'm afraid, and bring in Caroline Macklin from Cheltenham. Uh, briefly, please, your, your point, your question to Richard Dawkins. Yes, hi. Um, yeah, I'm concerned that um, policymakers are listening to people of all different faiths, um, who obviously exert, or their aim is to exert influence, but as far as I'm aware, we don't, um, the politicians don't listen to groups of atheists. How do you think we can rectify this? Um, and just one other point, how do atheists obtain the same protection that religious groups do currently? I, I, I can't you would, Well, uh, the point was that uh, a question as to whether politicians listen sufficiently anyway to atheists. I mean, you, you would probably feel they, they don't, but should they be doing so? Well, I think especially in America they don't. Uh, in America, notoriously, and, and, and it's more or less impossible for an atheist to get elected. There's no, um, there are plenty of lobbies in America which are very influential on congressmen, and uh, the one potential lobby, which actually is a pretty powerful one numerically, but totally powerless in terms of actual political power, the atheist lack of lobby is the one they never listen to. I think in Britain we don't have the same problem. Many of our members of parliament are obviously atheists, and uh, I don't think we have the same problem, although it is a remarkable fact that bishops still sit in the House of Lords uh, ex officio. Okay, we'll need to move on, I'm afraid. We're close to our uh, time running out. But let me briefly bring in Philip Stevens in North Wales, uh, here in the United Kingdom. Your question, please, to Richard Dawkins. Hello, I'd like to ask what Professor Dawkins thinks of uh, the teachings of Christ, which call out for peace and forgiveness. And I'd like to ask him what he thinks of Martin Luther King, uh, Gandhi, and more recently the Buddhist monks who led anti-pro-democracy uh, marches in Burma right. earlier okay. this year, all of whom have a message of peace and tolerance, and all of whom have a deep religious faith. So, okay, what about religion promoting peace, rather than, as we were discussing earlier, its connection with violence? I have enormous admiration for individual human beings who promote peace as opposed to promoting violence. Some of those individuals happen to be religious, such as Martin Luther King. Some of them don't, such as Bertrand Russell. It's the individual and what they actually promote that, uh, to me, matters. And I'm not trying to m make a list of religious people or non-religious people and count them up. I'm, I'm more concerned with what's true, uh, and um, that's my, my main concern. But as far as morals are concerned, uh, we can, you can point to as many good atheists as to as many good Christians and Hindus. Okay, Philip Stevens, briefly. Well, I, I have great respect for uh, Professor Dawkins' uh, views. I, I think they are valid, but I, I, I don't agree with them. Uh, I think uh, religion can be uh, a great force for good, uh, and it, it, it often uh, is more of a force for good, okay. in my opinion, than it is, right. than it is a force for evil. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, cutting off, because I want to go to an email that's come in while we've been on air from Sam in Cambridge. 
uh, who says, if God doesn't exist, why do you, Richard Dawkins, think society has created him? Well, uh, I think it's not difficult to see why people would uh, make up something as an explanatory device. We come into the world, it's obviously a very beautiful place, a very mysterious place, and we're faced with the question of where does it all come from? And it's natural for humans who are used to seeing humans make things. We're used to seeing houses that are built by people. We're used to seeing cars that are made by people, um, hand axes that are made by people. It's, naturally to th it's natural to think that the world was made by somebody as well. And until Darwin came along, that was uh, getting on for being a reasonable hypothesis. It was never very reasonable, but it was, it was only when, when Darwin came along and completely blew it out of the water that it, was, it became completely satisfying to be uh, to be an atheist. We now do have an explanation for where things come from. There are other reasons why it's psychologically satisfying to people to believe in God. People feel insecure, they want the reassurance of feeling a kind of father figure looking after them. Uh, so there are plenty of psychological reasons why humans might have invented God. Uh, one other email we've had in uh, just in the last few moments from John who asks you whether you feel more pessimistic now. Pessimistic now than what, I wonder? Uh, than when I started on the programme, do you think? Uh, <laughs> possibly, but <laughs> um, over time, I think. Over time, I think. For example, than, say, in the, in the 60s. Oh, no, I mean, I, 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 I think I'm an optimist, and, uh, and, and I think that, um, uh, that the world is a, is a wonderful place. Obviously, there are things to be pessimistic about, but, but it, that has nothing to do with religion one way or the, or the other, I think. I mean, there are things like global warming that we have to, that we have to worry about. I am very pessimistic uh, about uh, the, the grip that religion has on people's minds, and I suppose that's one respect in which I am a bit more pessimistic, because, it's say, in the 60s, it looked as though uh, um, the, the, the world was going to come to its senses, and... and um, just at the moment, it doesn't look as though it is. I you worried though that an effect of your, your stand, your very public one with the sales of these books, could be to further divisions in, uh, within religions and, and between the religious world and, and that of non-belief? I don't know. I, I think it's, I think it's, it's perhaps a, a good thing that there are some books like mine and Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris which are, which are fairly um, outspoken. I notice you use the word outspoken in your, in your introduction to me, outspoken atheist. You didn't call the Pope an outspoken Christian. Um, but, but there are plenty of other books which take a, a more moderate stance. I think there's room for all. Okay. Richard Dawkins, thank you very much indeed. And that is all we've got time for today. Many thanks to Professor Richard Dawkins and to everyone who's taken part. And I'm sorry if you didn't make it onto the program. You can still take part in the debate on our website, bbcnews.com slash have your say. We'll be back next week. Do join us again. But for now, goodbye from me, Mike Woolridge, and the rest of the team in London.